Just over a century ago, an unknown killer began a reign of terror that would never be forgotten. He stalked his prey in the back streets of London's East End. He was cunning and merciless, and with each attack, his bloodlust grew more frenzied. Then, no sooner had he burnt his name deep into criminal history and our imagination, than he was gone, and only his phantom remained to terrify successive generations and leave us wondering who he really was. Behind him, he had left five broken bodies, women on the lowest rung of Victorian society, whose immortality has been guaranteed in death as it never could be in life. Mary Ann Nichols, Annie Chapman, Elizabeth Stride, Catherine Eddowes, and Mary Kelly, whose death brought Jack's brief reign of terror to an end. Since then, the search to discover his identity has continued through a century-old fog that threatened to engulf the truth forever. Then, in 1991, a remarkable document came to light which promised to turn the known facts about the Whitechapel murders of 1888 on their head. Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. Um, I'm Robert Smith, Managing Director of Publishers Smith Griffin Limited. And my right is Shirley Harrison, who is the author of The Diary of Jack the Ripper. I think if the diary is true, then this solves a 105-year-old murder. This is the story of that document a 63-page handwritten account which claimed to have been written by the one person who knew more about Jack the Ripper than anybody else. A journal written by the same man who so far had only been known to the world by his chilling pseudonym, Jack the Ripper. Whoever Jack the Ripper was, he was a depraved and loathsome creature whose memory, many have argued, should have been buried in the earth beside his unfortunate victims. And yet today he remains, as he has from the very beginning, one of the world's most notorious murderers. But behind a hundred years of journalistic hype and sensationalism, there has always been a sincere desire to understand this unknown psychopath's sordid exploits and hopefully to identify the man behind the legend. Like some faded Rubik cube, the press and public alike have refused to let the puzzle rest unsolved. And with each new twist, Jack's future has been secured, despite the fact that there never has been any real evidence against anyone, including the three surviving names that were on the police suspect list at the time. Kosminski, a low-class Polish Jew, and Michael Ostrog, another immigrant. Montague John Druitt, a schoolteacher and barrister who committed suicide after the murders. In recent years, Queen Victoria's grandson, Prince Albert Edward Victor, the future Duke of Clarence, has become the most popular of suspects, even though he has a cast-iron alibi on each of the knights in question. And so others close to this most royal of rippers have taken their turn in the dock. The prince's friend and tutor, J.K. Stephen, and even 72-year-old Sir William Gull, physician to Queen Victoria. But if that encourages you to believe that we were destined to play the game of Hunt the Ripper by the same rules for another century, Perhaps you ought to think again. Believe it or not, this innocuous-looking book has just moved the goalposts. Is it the answer to the mystery that has intrigued successive generations? 
Or is it a cleverly constructed hoax aimed at an eager and gullible public? Experts considered the options. You mean went into his lodgings and then came out and dropped his apron? 40 minutes later. The publication of the journal which claimed to be the confession of Jack the Ripper was the culmination of 18 months intensive debate and research. But even before the full facts were known, some had already made up their minds. This is a fake, it's a modern fake. It was penned by someone who most likely was schooled in the 1930s. More detailed research has been done on this document than has ever been done on any discovery connected with Jack the Ripper. I believe now, absolutely, 100% that this diary is genuine. Uh, I'm sitting on the fence. I've been on the fence for so long, I'm developing piles. <laughs> <laughs> True or false, the responsibility for the journal's entrance centre stage was down to one man, Mike Barrett. His story begins not in the back streets of London, but in his hometown, Liverpool. It was here at the Saddle Inn that he met a retired print worker, Tony Devereux. I struggled for three-year acquaintance with him, and we've become very, very good, good, good mates. I used to go down every day of the week with his bread and with his milk and his bottle of sherry, and I ended up going down there this, this particular one day, and he turned around to me and said, "Here you are, Mick. Here you are. That's for you." I said, "What the hell is it? Take it home and do something with it." I said, well, what the hell? He said, take it home and do something with it. Mike Barrett discovered that his friend's gift was an old leather-bound scrapbook with some pages missing from the front. 63 of the remaining leaves contained a legible, if somewhat untidy, handwritten scrawl. What he read on the first page disturbed him. I long for peace of mind but I sincerely believe that it will not come until I have sought my revenge on the whore and the whoremaster. As Mike Barrett skimmed through the pages, it became even more clear that this was no ordinary diary. The thought of him taking her is beginning to thrill me. Tonight I may return to Battle Crease and take the unfaithful bitch. But it wasn't until he turned to the last page that the full impact of what he was reading really began to sink in. Uh, is fell off the back of a lorry story, huh? Don must have arrested countless people who told him that they got it from a man whose name they didn't know in a So one doesn't actually believe that, so it's either true or it's such a, a lame brain story that no great thought's gone into it. Is that what we're saying? I started doing my research, and the more research I've done, the more I seem to be getting nearer the truth. However, Having said that, Tony ended up dying in Walton Hospital with a massive heart attack. So I'm left with a diary that I'm not sure is 100% genuine. But that's what we're dealing with, and it is unsatisfactory. And now my personal opinion is that I do not believe that Mike Barrett is telling us the whole truth. I'm not saying it's a forgery, I'm not saying it's genuine. I'm saying my, my very strong feeling is that there is more to this story. Tony was never capable of forging. I honestly don't believe he was capable of forging. OK, so if Tony didn't forge it, where the hell did he get it from? The first we heard about this, Mike's original story, was that my father handed him this parcel and said, I want you to take this for being so good for me and looking after me. Now, that was what Mike told me. And I say he had plenty of people, genuine people, family looking after him, so there was no way you would have give this to a relative stranger. We'd only known for a couple of years on a casual basis. Um, I say his brother, if he ever did have this one in his possession and he didn't want it to give it to one of us because of what it was, I'm sure he would have given it to his brothers as well. Out. I pressurised that man and I asked him question after question after question and Tony would never ever give me an answer. I think he's possibly covering up something but yeah. I really do not think over the last nine months seeing him in the different moods we've seen him with his wife um, in his home he could have sustained it all this time. But those of us who all tend to, to be a little less critical of Mike Barrett are those of us who've met him. 
Michael Barrett I have never met. Uh, I've only heard what people have said. He can be telling every word of the truth, but a man he drank with in a pub gave it to him and said, you might find this interesting. It's not good enough. And I bet you cut this question. Mm -hmm. Since this has all happened, everybody, everybody, that's the Times, okay, Australian Press, CBS and your own company, okay, have all tried to break me and have all tried to change my story. Well, I think you prove you got it off my father. I know we can't stop him, but unless he can say, well, you know, here's the proof. Well, we don't think he should be using his dad's name. I'll never change the story because when you're telling the truth, you're telling the truth. <laughs> If the author of the diary was to be believed, he was being driven by a pathological hatred towards someone he constantly referred to as the whore or the bitch. Later, she would sometimes be called Florrie and even more affectionately, Bunny. This could have been his wife, as the writer also talks about the children, Bobo and Gladys. The diary also revealed a neurotic personality that fed off the extremes of love and hate, life and death. It painted a portrait of a man both tortured and thrilled by visions of his wife sleeping with the whoremaster. So, for example, at the beginning of the, of the account that survived, we certainly see him being very angry at his wife and being very angry at her lover and wanting to harm them, but then realizing he can't harm them, and at least not directly, for fear of being caught. And then one sees the object shift so that it becomes a prostitute, all whores then become the aim and the object for his vengeance. And the nice thing about the, the diary is you can actually see that motive change. The diary revealed an incomplete portrait of a man caught between two worlds. A respectable middle-class Victorian father, husband and businessman on the one hand, and a deranged psychopath seeking bloody revenge and sexual gratification on the other. And as for his actual identity, the answer would turn out to be one of the most remarkable elements of the entire mystery. On July the 31st, 1889, at St. George's Hall, Liverpool, Florence Elizabeth Maybrick, wife of James Maybrick, a well-respected Liverpool cotton merchant, pleaded not guilty to her husband's murder following his untimely death from suspected arsenic poisoning. The trial turned the pretty 25-year-old into an international celebrity. But the fact that she had confessed to an affair with one of her husband's friends, Alfred Brierley, did nothing to aid her defense. James Maybrick met Florence Chandler, as she was, on board ship coming back from America. He, was, he, was, uh, he worked in America. And she was then 18, very pretty, lively, uh, Southern American belle. And he was aging, pushing 50, and very aware of his declining years. She was um, a great catch. He continued with his womanizing, there's no doubt about that, all the time they were married. Um, she refused to sleep with him anymore, and that was the crunch, really. Um, he began to turn against her, and the marriage broke down completely. And by this time, his lifelong habit of taking arsenic and strychnine had really wiped him out. If the diary is to be believed, James Maybrick's habit of taking arsenic was fueling an already tormented mind. I cannot live without my medicine. I'm sure I can take more than any person alive. But how accurate was this portrait of Victorian drug abuse? The nice thing about the journal in terms of the way it talks about his use of medicine, first of all, he never actually calls it arsenic in the journal. He always refers to it as his medicine. Arsenic itself was a, was a very mild stimulant and it was an aphrodisiac. Wasn't really used in the way, for example, say cocaine might be used to get a, a high there and then, to be used as a major stimulant. And the journal reflects that. The journal doesn't actually have the individual who's writing it using it as a major stimulant in the way, for example, cocaine may be used. It's being used in a much more subtle way, much more akin to the way that arsenic might have been used. A week after the trial began, James Maybrick's young widow was found guilty of his murder and sentenced to hang. 
On the surface, the trial of Florence Maybrick would appear to have little in common with the events in Whitechapel, London the previous autumn. But there was no doubt that the diary was supposed to have been written by Florence's husband, James. Apart from anything else, the Maybrick's family home in Liverpool was known as Battle Crease. I believe the Maybricks moved in at the beginning of uh, 1888 and uh, I have the deeds of the house but of course there's no reference made to them in the deeds because they rented the property and then following her trial in 1889 uh, the, the Maybricks moved out again. This in fact was his bedroom I believe, um, his bed was over in the corner there and off this room was his dressing room and next door to that his study. Well, the electrics have always been a bit of a problem since I moved in and uh, I decided to have a total rewire and they, they fitted a new main to the flat in 1989, uh, I think. And then over a three year period, I had storage radi radiators fitted and I had a ring main installed in the, in the flat. The floorboards in James Maybrick's study had been lifted for the first time in over a century, just prior to the diary coming to light. According to the Times newspaper, the electricians denied finding anything at the house at this time, although two of them did admit to drinking at the same public house as Tony Devereux and Mike Barrett. In Liverpool, the Daily Post newspaper had been the first to become aware of the existence of the Ripper diary and the closely guarded secret of the author's identity. They too had expected to reveal a hoax. The first I heard about it was a phone call from a journalist colleague of mine um, back in April telling me that on a train journey from Liverpool to London, uh, he had met uh, a man who had the diary of Jack the Ripper. We ran that story in the Daily Post the next day. I thought, if somebody's bringing out a, a book of James Maybrick, saying Maybrick is a killer, I thought, well, it's a hoax. It's a hoax. It's a this piece of scientific apparatus was devised by us in the uh, early stages to um, try and assess as we were going along what we thought um, was the likely truth, if you like, about the, about the journal, about the whole affair, uh, the Ripperometer. And as you can see now, it's pointing more towards the truth. I'm, I've really been outvoted by my two colleagues. I'm still rather sceptical. My gut instinct, perhaps it's fem feminine intuition or something, but my gut instinct tells me it's true. It is. We've got the man. It appeared to be a hoax. It's a pretty incredible tale, isn't it? I got the diary of a man I met in a pub. I mean, who would believe that on the surface? So it's been one-sided. Since, it, since uh, the confidentiality agreement has come out, uh, the other side of it is now beginning to be heard. I mean, I've had a chance uh, for the Daily Post to read the diary and actually have actually seen it. It's a strange feeling to pick up this old battered ledger and say, well, I wonder if this is true. It's a strange feeling altogether. Um, if it is a hoax, it's the most fantastic piece of work. It doesn't read like a diary at all. In fact, it isn't a diary. It's more like the, the, I mean, there's no dates in it, there's no names. It doesn't say, it doesn't name James Maybrick, it doesn't name the Maybrick family by name at all in it. It drops clues. In fact, if you read it and you didn't know the Maybrick case, you wouldn't know, you wouldn't know that Maybrick is involved in it. It's a strange, strange hoax if it is a hoax. We've got a mysterious document which turns up by somebody who takes it in a very amateurish way to the market. Uh, apparently coming from a man who's dead and whose family knew nothing whatever about it. Oh dear, oh dear. And I don't care a damn what anybody says. Everybody is going to come at me and ask, tell me, is it a forgery? Is it this? Mm. Is it that? I've got no answers whatsoever. I just don't know. For some, the uncertain provenance of the journal was already enough to convince them that it had to be a fake others were less certain. Far from there being obvious errors in the text, there were many specific references that at least proved the author's attention to detail. For example, today it is accepted that Mary Ann Nichols was the first Ripper victim. At the time of the crimes, however, two earlier murders had also been attributed to the same hand. 
both Emma Smith and Martha Tabram were popularly believed to have been victims of Jack the Ripper. It wasn't until much later that it became clear that these murders were totally unrelated incidents. This fact alone showed that the journal was either a relatively modern fake or a much older document written by someone whose insight into the crimes went far beyond a superficial general knowledge. Was it even possible that a would-be forger could find a subject who would fulfill all the requirements of a plausible suspect? Could James Maybrick, a successful Liverpool cotton merchant, whose life and death was well documented, step into Jack the Ripper's shoes so easily? It was in the early hours that Mary Ann Nichols made her way towards Buck's Row in search of fourpence, the price of a bed at her lodging house. At approximately 3.30 a.m., somewhere in or near Osborne Street, she met someone. She must have thought her luck was in. <laughs> There was a flash of steel, and two deep slashes severed her windpipe. Her attacker then turned his attention to her abdomen. Lifting her skirts, he stabbed her vagina and tore at her stomach with a deep, jagged thrust which reached far enough up to cause her bowels to protrude through the wound. Within minutes of the attack, the body was discovered, but her murderer had already slipped back into the shadows, and Whitechapel was about to become a part of British criminal history. Whitechapel, Liverpool, was and still is one of the city's main shopping streets. To the author of the diary, however, it represents something else. Foolish bitch. I know for certain she's arranged a rendezvous with him in Whitechapel. So be it. My mind is firmly made. London it shall be, and why not? Is it not an ideal location? Whitechapel, Liverpool, Whitechapel, London. Ha, ha. No one could possibly place it together. But the choice of murder sites did not rest solely on the author's desire to play games, as Shirley Harrison discovered. We knew that his mistress came from, well, one of his mistresses, he probably had more than one, but um, in the early years that his mistress came from London. And we tracked her down and we found her and we traced her story back and we found that uh, she came to London from Sunderland and she lived in Whitechapel. And we found James living there too in the early years. I think that was the time when I suddenly thought, gosh, this, you know, we really are actually onto something here. This is getting quite exciting. The public face of James Maybrick was that of a successful businessman and a perfect gentleman. A business colleague spoke of him as one of the straightest and most upright men in a business transaction I have ever known. Another described him as the perfect host. Another remembers him being particularly kind and protective towards his children. But the truth that lay behind a heavy drape of Victorian double standards told a very different story. James Maybrick was a drug addict and an adulterer, and his health was deteriorating as quickly as his marriage. The commonly held belief, however, was that Florence had first met her future lover, Alfred Brierley, in December 1888, too late to provide the suggested motive for murder. In fact, they met in 87, um, a whole year before it's generally supposed they met. So that by the time the diary begins, which we've worked out to be probably March 88, um, they were already great friends. Yet again, the diary had shown itself to be historically accurate. And the possibility remained that we were stepping inside the dark and distorted mind of the real Jack the Ripper for the first time. I will not allow too much time to pass before my next. Indeed, I need to repeat my pleasure as soon as possible.
Annie Chapman was the Ripper's second known victim. And this time, her attacker was determined to get the maximum pleasure from his partner. A strong hand seized her by the throat and sliced into it twice, virtually severing her head. Then drawing her legs up and pushing her coat and skirt out of the way, he drove his sharp, pointed knife into her stomach. He reached in and lifted the small intestines, placing them above the right shoulder. Again, he used the knife to remove part of the belly wall, including the navel, the womb, the upper part of the vagina, and the greater part of the bladder. Grotesque as this murder was, the writer of the diary had one or two more images to add to the nightmare. I took some of it away with me. It is in front of me. I intend to fry it and eat it later. Ha, ha. It has taken me three days to recover. It did not taste like fresh bacon, but I enjoyed it, nevertheless. She ripped like a ripe peach. I will not feel guilty. It is the whoring bitch to blame, not I. I've left the stupid fools a clue which I'm sure they will never solve. Once again, I've been clever, very clever. One ring, two rings, a farthing, one and two. Along with M, ha, ha, will catch clever. Jim, it's true, no pill left but two. Inspector Joseph Chandler was one of the first officers at the scene. Apart from a leather apron that belonged to the son of one of the tenants, Chandler discovered a piece of screwed up paper and a piece of torn envelope. The paper contained two pills and on the envelope written in a man's hand, the letter M. At 6.30, the body was removed. It was now that he noticed the contents of the deceased's pockets, which were lying in an apparently neat pile. Popular accounts exaggerated the find as a pile of rings and coins. And although two brass rings had been wrenched from her fingers, the rest of her meagre possessions amounted to no more than two combs, a piece of coarse muslin, and, almost certainly, two farthings. One ring, two rings, a farthing, one and two. An interesting factor about his relationship, for example, with his wife, he tells us when he's thinking of the children that he's going to force out all thoughts of the children and just think about his wife when he's actually going to do the killings. So naturally one would expect that the victims, the more akin to his wife, the more they look like his wife, the more they resemble her, the more they would be a suitable victim. And yet here he is in one of the killings where he turns the rings off the fingers because they remind him of his wife. Part of him that feels sexually aroused by his wife is in love with his wife and yet part of him hates, and if the victim is too close to his wife, there's, there's too much of a reminder of that, then his feelings become confused. What he's really looking for is an object that he can just vent pure anger. Whoever Jack was, he was beginning to take more and more risks with each new exploit. The ferocity of his latest attack had increased dramatically, and its very audacity gave notice of a killer with an ever greater craving for blood. The journal, too, would have us believe that James Maybrick was on an emotional roller coaster ride to hell, and each page was bearing testimony to a tortured mind running out of control. Others were not so sure. Well, we know what he took from Annie Chapman. The Ripper took from Annie Chapman her uterus and her bladder. I consulted butchers and a chef, and they all confirmed that it would be physically impossible to eat a uterus by simply frying it. Cannibalism is one of the commonest aspects of sex crime. It happens again and again. I would say that um, one of the most interesting modern parallels um, with Jack the Ripper um, is Chikatilo, uh, apart from Gaskin, who again is tremendously similar. And uh, there again, you have this cannibalism, um, slicing off pieces of flesh and chewing them and chewing the uterus. In favor of the manuscript, I pointed out that it does not make an issue of the coins and rings at Chapman's feet. I should have expected somebody forging a diary to have made a point of these, and he didn't. So far, the diary had failed to make any obvious mistakes, and the M left on the torn envelope at Hanbury Street would prove to be just one of a series of remarkable coincidences. 
Following Annie Chapman's murder, Jack the Ripper's notoriety was assured as panic gripped London. And the journal exposed yet another facet of the killer's personality. He loved playing games. I have read of my deeds. They've done me proud, I had to laugh. They had me down as left-handed a doctor to slaughter man, a Jew. Very well. If they are to insist that I'm a Jew, then a Jew I shall be. I could not stop laughing when I read Punch. There for all to see was the first three letters of my surname. They're blind, as they say. It amuses me, so I shall write them a clue. A few days after the cartoon had appeared in Punch, the Central News Agency received a letter which began, Dear Boss, I keep on hearing the police have caught me, but they won't fix me just yet. And it was signed, Jack the Ripper. At last, a concerned public had a chilling but compelling hook on which to hang their anxiety. But had it in fact been written by the murderer? The diary was in no doubt. Before I am finished, all England will know the name I have given myself. But had the author of the diary finally made a mistake? In 1910, Sir Robert Anderson, the head of the CID at the time, had gone on record saying, I will only add here that the Jack the Ripper letter which is preserved in the police museum in Scotland Yard is the creation of an enterprising journalist. It was a view echoed by other eminent police officers of the day, and now many researchers have accepted that the so-called Dear Boss letter was probably a hoax. The question was, if the diary was a hoax, why would it deliberately contradict current popular opinion? We are getting to something that's very important, which is, I want to know who wrote the Dear Boss letter. Well, yes, let's be clear about this. The debate centered on the fact that Anderson As never specifically referred to the Dear Boss letter by name, but to the Jack the Ripper letter preserved at Scotland Yard. Another letter, known as the Lusk Letter, had been sent to the chairman of the Whitechapel Vigilance Committee, together with half a human kidney, two weeks after the publication of Dear Boss. And there was some evidence to suggest that this particularly sordid communication could have been the work of the journalist in question. The problem was, the Lusk Letter had been in the possession of the city police, and therefore could not have been the one Anderson had been referring to. At least, that was the current position until our researcher found a report sent by an inspector, James McWilliam, to the Home Office on October the 29th, 1888. In this confidential document, the inspector states that the Lusk letter had been forwarded to Scotland Yard. What we have here, at least, is an objection, which when we actually get to look at it a little bit more closely, what we see is that the journal has not made an error. No, no. I challenge the fact... Regardless of Anderson's statement, made 22 years after the events, police at the time had every reason to take this first Dear Boss letter very seriously indeed. It had informed the authorities that there would be another killing very soon, and that the killer would remove his victim's ears. Three days later, he struck again. In 1888, number 40 Burner Street was known as the International Workers' Educational Club. On September the 30th, the events which began outside this club would give future investigators more to ponder over than any other occasion. At approximately a quarter to one in the morning, Elizabeth Stride was seen being forcibly pulled into the street by a man. She resisted. The man then pushed her into the yard and yelled out Lipsky to a witness who crossed the road and hurried past. The witness also testified that at the same time as Stride was being attacked, a second man had come out of the public house opposite. Fifteen minutes later, Louis Diemschutz, a patron of the club, turned his pony and cart into the yard. The animal shied to the left as if trying to avoid something. Elizabeth Stride's body lay on the ground. But this time, there were no mutilations other than a deep gash across her throat, which had severed her windpipe. Was Stride's death the result of an argument with her abusive companion earlier, or was the second man her murderer? Was her death a totally independent incident, or another Jack the Ripper murder? Of course, the writer of the diary knew exactly what had happened that night. I cannot believe I have not been caught. I would dearly have loved to 
cut the head off the damned horse and stuff it as far as it would go down the horse's throat. I had no time to rip the bitch wide. I cursed my bad luck. I believe the thrill of being caught thrilled me more than cutting the horse herself. As I write, I find it impossible to believe he did not see me. Curiously, the journal draws our attention not only to the little-known fact that Elizabeth Stride's hair was red, but also to the possibility that she was killed with her own knife. The following night, a long, narrow-bladed knife with a keen edge was discovered in Whitechapel Road. It was caked with dry blood. Dr. Baxter Phillips gave evidence at the inquest and stated his opinion that such a knife would have inflicted the wounds on the murdered woman. The diary had once again alerted us to an important possibility that had been overlooked by modern historians, and that was just the beginning. Having been prematurely disturbed, Elizabeth Stride's killer was desperate to satisfy his lust despite the risk. My heart felt as if it had left my body. Within my fright, I imagined my heart bounding along the street with I in desperation following it. My satisfaction was far from complete. Within a quarter of an hour, I found another dirty bitch willing to sell her words. An hour after Elizabeth Stride had been murdered, PC 881 Edward Watkins of the city police passed through Mitre Square. The sight that greeted him was nothing less than diabolical. In a dark corner lay Catherine Eddowes. What had been her face was now a clownish mask of horror. Her nose and lips had been attacked with calculated ferocity. Her throat had been cut, and as in the case of Nichols and Chapman, her abdomen had been the killer's primary target. The left kidney and the uterus were missing, but there was something else. The thrill she gave me was unlike the others. I cut deep, deep, deep. Her nose annoyed me, so I cut it off. Had a go at her eyes, left my mouth. Under each of the victim's eyes had been carved two inverted V-shaped marks. Together, they formed the letter M. The killer was playing games, and so was the author of the diary. At the mortuary, the police took an inventory of Catherine Eddowes' meager possessions, which included a red leather cigarette case. No one had ever seen any significance in this article, the only item of any real value among a pathetic collection of odds and ends. No one, that is, except one man. He believes I will trip over, but I have no fear. I cannot redeem it here. Of this certain fact, I could send him post haste if he requests that be the case. The diary was referring to Inspector Frederick George Aberline, the detective controlling the investigation on the ground. Oh, Mr. Aberline, he is a clever little man. He keeps back all that he can. For do I know better? Indeed I do. Did I not leave him a very good clue? In an unpublished statement made at the time of Florence's trial, we discovered that according to George Bancroft, a friend of James Maybrick, he used to keep his drugs in what looked like a cigarette case. But this was not the only potential clue. I showed no fright and indeed no light. Damn it, the tin box was empty. The journal refers to this empty tin box, and the only place that we have ever been able to find reference to that is in the Catherine Eddowes uh, inquest papers. The existence of the empty tin matchbox was not known prior to 1987 when the police inventory of Catherine Eddowes' possessions became publicly available for the first time. The diary had either been written after 1987, or it was almost certainly genuine. My impression was of something that was not immediately genuine. I wasn't immediately convinced. If you're presented with um, an album that's intended for scraps, 
you, and you see pages torn out um, or cut out, then you immediately start asking questions about why that happened. There is a potential explanation for why the first pages are missing from the journal. That could be the case that, for example, it started out as being his normal diary, or it started out maybe as being a travel journal of his own, and that his normal relations with his wife and with his children and so on and with his business colleagues may have been in, recorded in there. But that as time goes on, as he discovers his wife's infidelity, he then starts to put down his feelings inside that, that journal. And instead of it becoming a record of his normal family life, his normal marital life, and his normal diary, it's rapidly become a piece of his psychopathology. It's now used as a, as a way of venting his feelings. It's now used as a way of expressing his feelings. And it would be understandable that he wouldn't want the two parts to be together in the same place. So he might well remove the first part of the diary. I've had a chance now to look at it uh, at, at greater length. I've read all the forensic documentation and so on. Um, my conclusion on the diary is that uh, it could be of that date, of, eight, uh, of 1888, 89, um, but it could also be later. I mean, he just didn't go out and get a book and a bottle of quink and sit down and write it. And so that's the next question, the bottle of quink. How easy would it be so now to give yourself a bottle yes. of quink that would um, pass the test? If somebody was going to produce a forgery of the Victorian diary now, they'd have to have some awareness of the inks that were being used at that time. Uh, it wouldn't be impossible uh, to reproduce the ink. Uh, you just need specialist knowledge. Inks of their nature dry out over time. Um, it's would be quite difficult to get hold of a Victorian ink, I feel, that is still usable. Initially, there was certainly nothing that I could see in it which would preclude the ink being of potentially Victorian date. Um, that begs a number of questions. The British Museum confirmed that, in their opinion, the diary was Victorian. The ink had also survived the closest scrutiny. <laughs> The hunt was on, and this time Jack the Ripper had disturbed two hornet's nests. Elizabeth Stride had been killed in Metropolitan Police territory, and now the city police had discovered the body of Catherine Eddowes on their patch. All hell was about to break loose, and Jack needed to reach safety as soon as possible. I have taken a small room in Middlesex Street. That in itself is a joke. It is indeed an ideal location. Middlesex Street was the dividing line between the Metropolitan and the City Police forces. The diary made perfect sense. If it ever got too hot in Metropolitan territory, Maybrick had only a few yards to go to the comparative safety of the city and vice versa. However, the following day the evening news carried this story. The belief is gaining ground that the murderer is not a frequenter of common lodging houses. He is supposed to make his home somewhere between Middlesex Street and Brick Lane. Mitre Square was only a couple of hundred yards from Middlesex Street, and now two police forces were on the alert. Unless their quarry led them away, he could well find himself surrounded. It was now that Jack the Ripper crossed to the north into Goulston Street. In an archway leading to one of the tenements, he stopped to clean the weapon that he had used on Catherine Eddowes. If his hideout is in Middlesex Street, he has to have passed it for some reason and dropped the apron. Well, I've heard all sorts of explanations of this. Whoever dropped the apron in Goulston Street carried it from Mitre Square to Goulston Street, whether it was covered in blood and feces or, or whatever. He had penetrated the woman's rectum. It was filthy, it was disgusting. Maybrick is not some sort of sewer rat. I mean, yes, OK, it was a nasty, filthy rag, but I can't say that Maybrick wouldn't... I can't say what Maybrick would or would not have done, I think. Having wiped his knife with a piece of her apron and thrown the cloth to the ground, her killer now did one of two things. He either left the scene or he took a piece of chalk from his pocket and wrote a message which would become one of the most intriguing and enduring of puzzles. It read, The Jews are the men that will not be blamed for nothing. But was it written by the Whitechapel murderer? And if so, why was the word Jew spelt incorrectly? Apparently, James Maybrick knew the answer. 
Very well. If they are to insist that I'm a Jew, then a Jew I shall be. I wonder if they enjoyed my funny Jewish joke. There can be no doubt that the writer of the diary was taking credit for the graffiti, and yet, in the diary, he had spelt the plural of Jew correctly throughout. It didn't appear to make any sense, or did it? In a Scotland Yard report filed by Inspector Henry Moore in 1896, he had quoted the Goulston Street graffiti as having been undoubtedly written by the murderer. He continued by saying that the word Jews was spelt precisely as it had been originally. The solution, as far as the journal was concerned, had literally been staring us in the face the whole time. Did the word spell Jews or James? They want, but a Jew they want me to be, so a Jew I will become. And then, as Martin has pointed out, James does convert into Jews on the wall. To try and turn it into a James Maybrick message that way is to produce sheer raving nonsense. And anybody who holds it up as proof that the diary is genuine is going to be seen as barking mad. I don't think the Jews making James on the wall is at all silly. On the contrary, you know, I think it's just one more little piece of evidence. <laughs> A day after the murder of Elizabeth Stride and Catherine Eddowes, another little piece of evidence, written in the same hand as Dear Boss, was received by the Central News Agency. I was not codding, dear old boss, when I gave you the tip. You'll hear about saucy Jackie's work tomorrow. Double event this time. Number one squealed a bit, couldn't finish straight off. Had not time to get ears off for police. Thanks for keeping last letter back till I got to work again. Jack the Ripper. I don't take any of the Ripper letters seriously. Uh, I think that, again, one of the things which was fascinating and problematic about the document, as one first saw it, was the obvious claim that he wrote the Dear Boss letter. I certainly don't believe that the Dear Boss letter was written by a journalist. I think it was written by Jack the Ripper. Confirmation that the ears had not been cut off as promised in the earlier letter was just one detail that encouraged the police to believe that Dear Boss had been written by the murderer, so much so that facsimiles were circulated throughout the city. Research has also revealed that the postcard had been sent from the same district where the bloody knife that could have killed Stride was found, and at the same time. Further evidence was also coming to light as close examination of the diary uncovered links to other obscure references they revealed an emerging pattern of clues. According to Assistant Commissioner Sir Melville McNaughton, one of the first poems he had seen on joining Scotland Yard in 1889 read, I'm not a butcher, I'm not a yid, nor yet a foreign skipper, but I'm your own light-hearted friend, yours truly, Jack the Ripper. According to a 1937 source, this poem had been received two weeks before the Dear Boss letter. In the diary, James Maybrick thinks of his brother. Michael would be proud of my funny little rhyme. Recent research has also come across a hitherto unpublished letter sent to the Central News Agency on October the 5th. At this time in the diary, our author writes, I shall send Central another. I would say that um, if this is a forgery, then the number of coincidences are so tremendous that um, the man has really had incredible luck. No, I, I don't think that, in any sense, James Maybrick is the easiest of people to use. I think he's a very risky person. The, the, the way in which the forger has had enormously good luck is that Maybrick was a hypochondriac. He went to his doctor or chemist, what, about 70 times a year, didn't he? And this, this is recorded. Those visits went down in their logs and in their prescriptions books. And by incredible good fortune, not one of those 70 times conflicts with the times when the diary says Maybrick was in London. I don't think that anybody could really have uh, had that much luck. It was in these areas where the journal had taken specific responsibility that researchers expected to uncover concrete evidence that the journal was a fake. In practice, what was happening, however, 
was almost the opposite. Many people took the view that further research tended to support the journal's claims, not diminish them, as was the case with the Dear Boss letter. Apart from anything else, the weight of circumstantial evidence in favour of the journal was considered more than any self-respecting hoaxer had any right to expect. There was the M left at Hanbury Street, the marks on Catherine Eddowes' face, the coincidence in the misspelling of Jews written on the wall at Goulston Street. There was James Maybrick's connection with the East End, his known addiction to dangerous drugs, and his habit of frequenting brothels. There was also the fact that none of his known movements conflicted with any of the murder dates. One thing was clear. The feeling that it was all just too good to be true seemed insufficient justification for dismissing the journal as a hoax. The Hitler Diaries has done probably a lot of damage. People are very frightened because they're now seeing that the possibility of their reputation is being damaged. And so their initial reaction was, this is a forgery. And, and I think everybody's initial reaction to the document was that this is a forgery. It's just that as time has gone by, uh, the proof has been lacking. Well, those who believe in it most passionately now are going to be the first to admit that when they first heard the suggestion, James Maybrick was Jack the Ripper, and here's a journal to prove it, their instant reaction was rubbish. I think it is the natural reaction. Yes, I think it all begins to sort of um, come together for me. At, uh, as I say, starting off rather dubious about the whole thing, I've gradually become more and more convinced. There isn't anything that I know that actually shows that this is a, a modern forgery. It's not the sort of diary that I could imagine someone writing as a hoax. Sit down to write, I mean, if, if perhaps if you and I were writing a hoax, we'd do it more dramatically uh, and perhaps more logically. This, to me, um, reads the ravings of a tormented soul, you know, uh, unless it's a double bluff. But this is say, if it's a double bluff, it's an incredible piece of work by someone. The debate surrounding the Dear Boss letter had raised more questions than answers. Not least was, why would a forger take responsibility for writing a letter which may have been written by someone other than Jack the Ripper? Furthermore, having so decided, why did he make no attempt to copy the handwriting? The Dear Boss letter, first of all, I couldn't see the original in the... Um public record house, the, it looks like an original, but it's not. And the evidence is that we have the two parts of a postcard on the same side. So no pressure at all. The handwriting is like, um, like a copybook almost. It is a facade writing. It's not spontaneous. It's, not, it's more like a painting or like a plans that someone draws. It's, it's not a writing. It's not a real writing. It is very, very hard to compare it to any uh, other kind of handwriting. Anna Corrin is one of the world's leading handwriting experts and it made sense that anyone writing to the police would disguise their hand. But what about the diary? Could someone have emulated the characteristics of a complex and disturbed personality? No, no way. It must be someone who um, is disturbed. It couldn't be someone who can pretend all this uh, handwriting characteristics and adopt them to without having it in his character. My first impression was that the um, writer of this uh, journey was totally disturbed, very weird with a strong uh, schizophrenic uh, tendency. This is the most uh, famous or known schizophrenic uh, woman. She had uh, 97 characters in one body and we can see a few of them, and you can see the changes in her handwriting. So the more schizophrenic you are, the more different handwritings you have. I found some um, a hypochondria tendency. The handwriting looked um, like under drugs and, uh, and disturbed. The long T-bars and the, the way of uh, how he connects the letters shows that this is a person who likes to play games, maybe chess, maybe other games. Here we can see a, it looks like a knife in the lower zone, and this look like, looks like a very, very phallic uh, symbol, right? 
So, and, and it's not the same. It's never the same. Everyone is another, is a different one. Everyone. It is so weird. It is like someone who, who in, invented something in the lower zone, which has to do with sex. With all my experience for many, many years as a professional, I couldn't throw it. There's no way I could. Despite Anna Corrin's conviction that the diary had been written by a dangerous schizophrenic psychopath, other experts had determined that the only written document apparently signed by James Maybrick, his last will and testament, was in a different hand, and therefore the diary had to be a forgery. But this supposedly conclusive evidence was far from the end of the story. Well, the handwriting hasn't bothered me. Um, I have to say it is obviously the most difficult part because for most people, the fact that the diary itself is in a handwriting that doesn't appear to be matched by anyone else at all. I mean, it's not the same as the Dear Boss letters. It's not the same um, as the will, which is allegedly by James Maybrick. Um, it is a problem. This is a forgery. <laughs> It's done by somebody who knows paper. It's done by somebody who knows ink. It's done by somebody who knows the Ripper. It's done by somebody who knows Maybrick. It's done by somebody who doesn't make a hiccup in terms of the psychology of the individual who's doing it. But he doesn't make one slight effort to make the handwriting look like anything. In fact, we're very uncertain whether that will is by James. In 1891, Alexander MacDougall, a well-respected lawyer, published a treatise on the Maybrick case. He quotes in full the will which James Maybrick had made as he lay dying in bed. I knew that uh, James Maybrick was very, very ill when he wrote his will, which does not show in the will. MacDougall describes the will he saw as being written in a large and shaky hand, unlike the document now accepted as being the original. James's brothers took up to him on the night before he died papers that were said by the servants to have been a will, and he was heard to shout, let me die in peace, um, and it was obviously being pressured to do something he didn't want to do. There are reasons to think that they may have um, written the will for him. There are also several minor differences between the existing will and the one quoted by MacDougall. In particular, MacDougall's transcript spells James Maybrick's daughter's name, Evelyn, correctly. In the surviving version, it's spelt on both occasions with an extra E. E-V-E-L-E-Y-N. No, no, I think under no circumstances would a father um, add an extra E to his daughter's name when he was spelling it. It's virtually impossible. By the end of September, various lines of police inquiry had shown some promise. The phrases, Dear Boss, Fix Me, and Shan't Quit, in the original Dear Boss letter and later correspondence, had already encouraged the belief that Jack the Ripper could have been an American or have had an American connection. James Maybrick had lived in America until 1881 and had continued to visit regularly on business. Further investigation reveals that there was also a strong connection to Maybrick's hometown, including several letters postmarked Liverpool. Another was written on newspaper, but this time it wasn't the message that held the clue but the first line of the first article. Liverpool has been shocked at the mad escapades of one or two well-known businessmen. On October the 11th, the Liverpool Daily Post carried a story of police traveling to Liverpool in search of the owner of a suspicious black leather bag that had been left in a London hotel. Our research has since uncovered an earlier advertisement calling for hotel guests to reclaim lost property at the Charing Cross Hotel. On the list was a curious surname, S. E. Mibrak. The net was beginning to close. A letter written in 1913 by Inspector John Littlechild, head of the secret department at the time of the murders, confirms that a team of detective officers were sent to America to interview a suspect. Yes, he was an American. Um, he was a likely suspect to, to use little child's own words, to my mind, a likely one. And uh, really doesn't enlarge much more on it than that. His suspect was not James Maybrick, but... Yes, he has got a Liverpool connection, which is very interesting. 
Another coincidence. Or had the police got the wrong man? On the night of the double murder, Jack the Ripper had been seen by various witnesses. Soon after, this sketch had appeared in the Daily Telegraph. Seen alongside two photographs of James Maybrick, the likeness is startling. From the shape of the face and the hairline to the nose, eyes and eyebrows. On the same day as the sketch appeared, this letter was sent to an unnamed witness. You thought yourself very clever when you informed the police. Now I know you know me. I mean to finish you and send your ears to your wife if you show this to the police or help them. You see, I know your address. It was signed Jack the Ripper, and document experts agreed that it was written in the same hand as the Dear Boss letter. The plain fact of the matter was that after 18 months, the final proof of the journal's authenticity had been as elusive as ever. The main hope was that somewhere, another example of James Maybrick's handwriting existed. Something that would finally prove the journal one way or the other. So far, extensive research had failed to unearth that vital link. But then something did turn up. Something that nobody had bargained for. Just before we um, were due to go to press, we had another phone call uh, from another bloke in Liverpool to say that he had a watch. Uh, I was at work uh, talking to a couple of friends about watches. Somebody bought a watch, and I said I had an 18 karat gold watch at home, and I bring it in to show them. I showed them how to open the, the back and the front, and we're looking in it, and the light in the window, you can see the scratching inside the back of the watch. And we thought, oh God, here we go, you know, pull the other one. <laughs> Nobody's going to believe this. And in fact, we all thought what a dreadful liability this is going to be because, in fact, far from supporting the diary, we were afraid it was going to undermine it because it looked like a forgery. Inscribed very faintly on the inner cover of the Victorian watch was I am Jack, James Maybrick's signature, and the initials of Jack the Ripper's victims plus two more that the author of the diary had claimed he had killed in Manchester. Research to date had failed to discover these unreported murders, but their inclusion in the watch meant that the engraver was privy to highly confidential information. I did like Don Rumbelow's remark, this gets more and more like the William Henry Ireland forgeries all the time. First the document, now the artefacts are starting to turn up. Uh, my initial reaction to the watch was um, exactly like yours, that, you know, this is just too good to be true, it's got to be concocted. Uh, but this microscopic evidence um, does seem fairly conclusive. At Manchester University's Institute of Science and Technology, one of the country's leading metal experts, Dr. Stephen Turgus, examined the scratches under an electron microscope. He found nothing to indicate that they had been done recently, and, importantly, Several minute particles of brass left by whatever instrument had made the engravings had, unlike the gold, corroded enough to suggest that they had been embedded in the surface many years earlier. And of course these two tiny bits of corroded brass, actually which are visible under the electron microscope, do seem to indicate that you know, it could not be a, a forgery. Incredibly, however, it didn't end there. On James Maybrick's family crest, inscribed in Latin, was his personal motto. It reads, Tempus omnia revelat. Time reveals all. Whether the Sunday Times had revealed all was still debatable. Among other things, together with document examiner Kenneth Rendell, they had accepted the Oxford English Dictionary's reference that the term one-off used in the diary, had only come into common usage in 1934. Had they found a fatal mistake? You have the vernacular use of expressions long, long before they get into the dictionaries, and uh, certainly the use of uh, one-off, which was one that caused trouble at the beginning, uh, we've now found turning up in builders' records and in engineering records in the 1860s and earlier. 
This time, the diary had not only proved to be historically accurate, but it had exposed the shortcomings of existing reference material. Nevertheless, opposition to it was still mounting. Forensic scientist Rod McNeil, having conducted an iron migration test on the ink and paper, was adamant the diary had been written in 1921, give or take a dozen years either way. Later, however, he conceded that long-term environmental conditions could make the document even older. I was in uh, Melbourne when somebody said to me, oh, it's all been proved to be a fake. And I said, oh, my God, no. Then they produced me the press cutting in which he said it was a fake written around about 1921, give or take 12 years. I said, oh, thank God for that. That means it's definitely genuine. There is no way that this journal could have been produced between 1909 and 1933, he claims. The whole description of the murders is not one that anybody would have been capable of putting together at that time. Without realizing it, Dr. Turgus, McNeil, and the Oxford English Dictionary had put the cat back among the pigeons. If it's a forgery, I think it was done in 1987 or 1988, or earlier. No, I don't think it was done any earlier. I think it would be difficult to exclude the possibility for certain that this was some, the workings of someone's fantasy at the time of the Ripper killings. But I would find it difficult to believe that. I think there are certain items of information that are contained within the diary that wouldn't have been available at that stage, wouldn't have been known at that stage. Similarly, the psychological processes that the killer was going through as reflected in the, the diary would have been difficult to have consciously have forged at that stage. There were no Ripper murders in October. Once more, the diary supplies the reason. I have been unwell. The whole of my body is pained. By November, the Ripper was ready to begin again. According to the diary, James Maybrick's room in Middlesex Street had outlived its usefulness, and staying at his brother Michael's London address presented its own problems. If it were not for Michael insisting we take dinner, I would have tried my hand that very night. I curse my stupidity. I was forced to stop myself from indulging in my pleasure by taking the largest dose I have ever done. The pain that night has burned into my mind. I vaguely recall putting a handkerchief in my mouth to stop my cries. I believe I vomited several times. The pain was intolerable. I'm convinced God placed me here to kill all whores. For he must have done so. Am I still not here? Nothing will stop me now. On the morning of November the 9th, Thomas Bowyer left his employer's shop on the corner of Dorset Street to collect some rent from the tenant at number 13 Miller's Court around the corner. Getting no reply, he went round to a side window where an old rag had been stuffed into a broken pane. Pushing it aside, he looked in. What he saw would stay with him to his dying day. What had been Mary Kelly, was lying on the bed. The surface of the abdomen and thighs was removed and the abdominal cavity emptied of its viscera. The breasts were cut off, the arms mutilated by several jagged wounds and the face hacked beyond all recognition. The tissues of the neck were severed all around down to the bone. The face was gashed in all directions. The nose, cheeks, eyebrows and ears being partly removed. The heart had also been removed and placed with other flesh on the bedside. Now the diary was prompting us to look for yet another indication of the killer's identity. I left it there for the fools, but they will never find it. I was too clever. Left it in front for all eyes to see. Behind the victim's bed, not just an M this time, but FM for Florence Maybrick. An initial here and an initial there will tell of the whoring mover. He starts to think that the only way he can get any possible release at all from the mental anguish he's going through is by venting his anger, by actually destroying something, i.e. in this case the prostitutes that he's now displaced his anger onto because he can't destroy 
his wife or his wife's lover because he'll be caught. And then as he does start to kill, one starts to see the thrill component coming through. He's actually starting to, to be thrilled by it. His two worlds had finally collided, and it signaled the beginning of the end. I've lost my battle and I shall go on until I'm caught. Perhaps I should top myself and save the hangman a job. At this moment, I have no feeling in my body, none at all. Will peace of mind ever come? The pain is unbearable. Bonnie knows all. On May the 8th, Florence wrote to her lover. Towards the end, she writes, The tale he told me was pure fabrication and only intended to frighten the truth out of me. Had James told her the truth? Had he taken his final revenge? At the end of the day, Florence's fate was to be greatly influenced by one man, Judge James Fitzjames Stephen. On the first day of his summing up, Judge Stephen had been in full command of the arguments, both for and against the prisoner. And by the time the court adjourned, he had painted a picture favourable to the accused. Later that night, however, he was found pacing his rooms, repeating, that woman is guilty, that woman is guilty. The following day, his summing up developed into a direct attack on Florence Maybrick. Something had turned the learned judge against her. Was it possible that the true nature of James Maybrick's life and death had been made known to the man who now held Florence's destiny in his hands? This is, of course, pure speculation, except for yet another remarkable coincidence. J.K. Stephen was the friend and confidant of Prince Albert Edward Victor the future Duke of Clarence, whose doctor was Sir William Gull. Three men who have all become Ripper suspects. J.K. Stephen also knew Montague John Druitt, yet another. Perhaps with hindsight, the suspicion against these men should never have pointed at what they might have done, but at what or who they had known. For the simple fact of the matter is this. J.K. Stephen was none other than Judge Stephen's son, the man who had so unjustly turned against Florence Maybrick. Was it his son's knowledge of who Jack the Ripper was that has caused the finger of suspicion at one time or another to point at those associated with him? Did Jack the Ripper's trail lead to J.K. Stephen's father, Judge Stephen, and ultimately to the real Jack the Ripper, James Maybrick. It took the jury just 38 minutes to reach their verdict, and Florence Maybrick was duly sentenced to hang. Before leaving the courtroom for the last time, she bowed to his lordship and said, My lord, everything has been against me. Although evidence has been given as to a great many circumstances in connection with Mr. Briley, much has been withheld which might have influenced the jury had it been told. Two days before Florence Maybrick was due to hang, her sentence was commuted to life imprisonment thanks to the massive weight of public opinion that finally contradicted the notion that justice had been done. Fifteen years after her imprisonment, Florence was finally released. And whatever the true story of her life with James Maybrick was, it stayed with her till her dying day. Now, more than a century later, perhaps the fog has finally begun to clear. Was James Maybrick an innocent murder victim or a depraved monster whose legend refuses to die? If this is a forgery, then the number of coincidences are so tremendous that um, the man has really had incredible luck. Well, he's also had extremely bad luck in that people feel very once bitten, twice shy, and his document has been put through searching examination of a kind that no previous Ripper discovery ever has been. If it's a modern forgery, fine. Um, the problem so far has been that 
various tests have been conducted to try and show that it is a modern forgery, and, and that that's not what they're showing. Many historians are confident that this is either a brilliant hoax, written sometime after 1987, or genuine. They think any other explanation is impossible. On the other hand, forensic science would appear to indicate that it was written much earlier. Any other conclusion is also impossible. Perhaps another celebrated Victorian, Sir Arthur Conan Doyle, was right. When you have eliminated the impossible, whatever remains, however improbable, must be the truth. I pray whoever shall read this will find it in their heart to forgive me. Remind all, whoever you may be, that I was once a gentleman. May the good Lord have mercy on my soul and forgive me for all I have done. I give my name that all may know of me, so history do tell what love can do to a gentleman born. Yours truly, Jack the Ripper.